Again, I, I thank you for the invitation to be here. And Katie and her family are on vacation. And it has been so delightful. I'm just a real Facebook freak. But it's so delightful to see so many people who finally, we're on the road. People are experiencing summer. And, and despite the heat, people are traveling and having adventures. And we've all needed this season of letting go. So I, I applaud you that you have let her go in the best kind of way and we'll do our best while we're here together. Uh, two things is I am going to do a demo here and if you want to move where you can see, all the rules are suspended and you're welcome to move wherever you might need to. And also as a retired pastor who will go away and you can say whatever you wish, I'm going to call an audible on the last hymn. And we're not going to sing the one that's printed in the bulletin. <laughs> you know, you know, people get that way. And that's why I'm leaving. And we're going to sing uh, Lord of the Dance. Because if David danced, well, shouldn't we? And, and I'm going to be honest with you. The, the A30 crowd kind of disappointed me because we're, we're, we gotta, we got to get the dance thing going. Just a little bit. Okay? Okay? So 261, but we'll remind you of that when we get to the end. As a child, I drew. My father was an engineer and he would bring his blueprints home from work and we, we drew. We would roll them out on the floor with our crayons and we drew everything. We drew over the airport plans and the sewer plans and the bridge plans and we turned them into everything else and we drew. As a child, somehow along the way, and some of you may know what I mean, is that somewhere drawing lost its magic. Or I got busy, I played the piano, I played ba basketball, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things get in the way. But always in the back of my heart, I trusted that one day I would return to this. And in fact, what I wanted most to do was to do watercolor. Finally, as an adult, on a mission trip, I went to Cambodia. It was an amazing experience, and I saw things that just filled my heart and soul. And I took pictures out the Wadzu, and we took so many pictures, and, and some of them were really, really good pictures. It captured what I saw, but it really didn't capture what I saw. And I decided I needed to do that differently. And the next time I went back to Cambodia, I took my little sketchbook with me and I began to sketch what I saw. And even though it was rough and amateur and unshaped, it captured something that pleased me very much. And that's how I came back. And now I'm retired and now like to piddle with art. I have a whole art room. Scott won't even go in my art room. It's way too cluttered. Do you know how that is when you have four different art projects going all at the same time? He just, mm -mm. he won't even come to the room. But that's okay. He, he gives me that space to do and to be, and I appreciate it very much. The scripture today is not about painting, and by the way, for those of you that are going, oh my gosh, she's dripping, uh, not to fear, there's a drop cloth on the floor. Everything's up, you know, everything's cool. Um, but the, the text today is not about painting, it's about dancing. David, in this glorious moment that we see, in this glorious moment, David is returning to what will become Jerusalem. The ark is being moved back into the place, not the temple. The temple doesn't exist right yet. And if you'll remember, David won't get to build the temple. That will fall to his son. But there is a special tent, place of holy. The holy of holies has been set up in this portable tent of old. And a place is ready for the ark of the covenant. This beautiful, holy center of their faith to arrive in Zion. It is a great moment. There is a parade. Now, we're pretty good at parades. 
We got the Mardi Gras thing down pretty good. But they, they I mean, this was, this was a full out, everybody on, ready to go. There are trumpets, there are fanfares, there are dancing girls. I'm sure had they had them, there would be boom boxes and bands and the whole nine yards. And before David could even get into the center of the city, he stops to, sacri to make a sacrifice. Okay, there are all kinds of ways to look at Old Testament sacrifices. Let's just call them barbecues. Because there's this, I mean, they're just, they are breaking it down, folks. And they, they dance their way, they literally dance their way into the city. David dances before the Lord with abandon. He forgets who he is, where he is, that he's king, that he's supposed to be dignified. And I think he, I, I truly think he is just doing the line dance with all of the young women. And they, he just, he forgets who he is. Abandon in the creative spirit. Now you guys have been talking about the creative spirit all summer how that manifests in, in many disciplines, in writing, music, art, the spoken word, theater, just a multitude of ways. And one aspect of any art is to, get, to be so good at it that you just simply can abandon yourself to it. You forget who you are, time flies away. We pay perfectly good money to go and see people who have practiced hours and hours and they are so good at what they do that they make it look effortless when Matt plays his little prelude he didn't just fix that yesterday he probably sight read that piece but we're not going to clock the number of scales and hours and arpeggios and this that and the other so that when he sits down it's just effortless and we all relax into it, because it's a gift. There are all kinds of folks who, who, who rise to such a degree of expertise and perfection, and they may have a natural talent, or they may have just been what we call in the golf world grinders. They're not particularly good at it, but they have just worked so hard at it that they rise to a level, a level of expertise. There's an abandonment that happens when people are literally at the top of their game. But there's also an abandonment when us regular people begin to do something and we forget who we are. This morning in the fellowship hall, I challenged the group that was there to make 100 flowers in 30 minutes. No rules, just crank it out. And this flurry of activity started. And I hope people begin to go, well, I don't, I, this looks stupid. I'm not going to put this up there. Be, no, 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 no. Just make four flowers. Each person had an assignment. Make four flowers. Now, some people made a whole bunch of flowers, and some people just made one. But we abandoned ourselves to the fellowship and the community and the laughter that filled the room. And some folks really got into it, and other folks visited. There was this energy that happened when we all shared in this experience. We abandoned our, our self-consciousness and we just colored and cut and pasted and had a good old time. Abandon. Abandon. When Scott and I go to um, parades, Mardi Gras parades, we're thinking, I don't need any more plastic stuff in my house. I don't need plastic shiny beads. And I'm telling you, within 15 minutes' time, we are pushing small children and old ladies out of the way, yelling, throw me something, mister. And in that moment, we simply abandon ourselves to the joy of the moment we forget who we are. And may you all have that moment of absolute abandonment, whether it's in the craft of your hands, whether whatever, whatever it is where you create and for one moment, you are just completely forget who you are. And you just do it. Sometimes the product, what you end up with, is frameable, singable, preservable. And sometimes what you end up with, well, 
it goes in the dustbin. And nobody else will know, but it doesn't matter because of the joy of the creative abandonment that has happened. Well, hold on, I need to get a little more color up here. Special watercolor technique. There we go. Now David has a ball, and everybody that's with him has a ball, except for his wife. Now, this is already a very complicated situation. Michal, you did that right. We said that. She has an odd name. It's one of those biblical names, and you don't know if you should call her Michelle or Michelle or Michael. Yeah, we're going with Michal, and I got to get that little thing going in the back. She is David's wife, but she is also the former king. This is a little Israel history. Saul was the first king of Israel. The people asked for a king, and God said, Are you sure you really want a king? And they said, Oh, everybody else has a king. We need a king. And God gives them Saul, and it's not such a great experience. At one point, David is the general of all the armies, and, and David is this young, handsome fellow, goes out and has a big battle, and he comes back in triumph, and Saul presents his daughter, Michal, to David, his wife. She is literally a trophy wife. But there's not much evidence that there was any affection anything that we would call a marriage between them because after this great day of victory on this day of victory when David danced all the tribes of Israel have been united everyone has come into the city of Jerusalem the Ark of the Covenant has been restored into the center of their community everyone is just ecstatic except Michal because she looks out the window and she sees this David comes in for the evening. He finally, <laughs> he finally, to make everybody go home, he sent everybody home with a loaf of bread, a cake of raisins, and a cake of dates, and said, look, you people, guy, you got to take the party home. We're done here. And would send them home. And when he goes home, she confronts him. She says, how the king of Israel honored himself today? Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants' maids as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. There's a lot of uncovering going on here. <laughs> now, I don't know. Now, some people say he danced in his altogether before the Lord. One movie I saw is Richard Gere dances before the Lord in something that looks like a big diaper. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if... There was a lack of clothing. I don't know if he had on his regal robes and he just got down and lost his dignity. But she holds him, and this is the word I give you. This is a dangerous, dangerous word. The word is contempt. She holds her husband in contempt. Now, I asked my brother, who's a lawyer, I said, um, what is it to be in contempt of court? And he said that it has to be to be chargeable at court it has to be an action. It has to be something you do or don't do to fail to cooperate. It has to be an act. It just cannot be a simple eye roll. But I want to tell you that the first sign of holding someone in contempt is to roll your eyes at them. Now, teenage daughters are very good at this. <laughs> and they usually grow out of it. And teenage daughters or teenage sons are very good at rolling eyes at dad jokes and other things like that. That happens. But when contempt takes root in a relationship, when contempt takes place within a society or a community, when contempt where you hold the other person and their ideas or their actions, you hold them in scorn. Isn't that a terrible word? To hold someone in contempt is to reject their personhood, their ideas, their very presence. And contempt is even more insidious. Violence and hate are out front. 
but contempt slips under the door and comes in to turn violence and hate among intimates. McCall held her husband in contempt. Now in the world of creative work, okay, this is actually, this is not a party trick, but it works like that. But this actually, to do this this way is to get paint where I want it. And I'm gonna flip this around now. In our artistic life, in our creative life, a poison that prevents us from living into our creative selves is contempt. To think that what I'm painting, well, it looks like a kindergartner painted it. Nobody will ever, we won't frame it. It's not good enough. It means to sing in such a way that, well, I can't sing an aria. I can't sing anything, so why would I sing at all? And these gracious people stand up and sing in front of us and give them, give that to us. But, but contempt, contempt is so dangerous. A child draws a picture and someone says, uh, well, what is that? Instead of, tell me about your picture. We start out in our lives with this, with this lovely abandon of art and being able to do anything because we don't know that we can't. And then before you know it, somebody says, well, what is that? What did you do? And we lose our confidence. And it doesn't even have to be a big thing. It's just a, a, a tiny thing. And somehow our insecurities are comparing ourselves to someone else and we lose, we lose, the, not the creativity, we lose the courage. Contempt is so dangerous. McCall had contempt for David dancing before the Lord. David had an answer. David had an answer. He says to her, we didn't read this earlier, he says to her, David said, it was more for the Lord who chose me in place of your father. Remember, this is a very complicated relationship. There's some, there's some father-husband stuff going on. It was before the Lord who chose me in place of your father and all his household to anoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. I have danced before the Lord. Because God chose him, David danced. He danced for all he was worth. And he says, I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in my own eyes. David danced with abandon. McCall greeted him with contempt. And now David is saying, I will be vulnerable and I will continue to be vulnerable. Instead of, he does push back. I, I have to tell you that he does push back. But in fact, the way through for creative life is to let ourselves be vulnerable. One of the things that helped me when I first started re recreating myself as an artist was there was a, 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 an online thing, one of the first online things I'd ever done, called Sketchbook School. And the guy's premise was that anybody can draw. You say you can't draw? He was convinced that anybody can draw. No, you're not going to be a Mona Lisa. You're not going to be a Leonardo da Vinci. But anybody can draw. And he began to do things on this video lesson and it was so fascinating, it was so much fun. And the one thing you had to do was be vulnerable to post your work. Now it was a safe place because there was a rule for all of us, you couldn't, it wasn't to critique, which has its place, but it wasn't in that place. There are critiques and they are good and helpful, but we were not critiquing our work, we were simply taking the baby steps to renew our confidence that 
we could make a mark and it could tell a story. We were vulnerable. Being vulnerable with art, goodness, I'm standing in front of you painting a picture. There's a certain vulnerability because you're going, what is she doing? What is this? There's a vulnerability for someone to say, well, I know why she didn't go to art school. <laughs> and obviously she didn't. There's a vulnerability that some part of me is before you. And that happens with anyone who shares their gift in public. We become vulnerable for someone to look at it and go, hmm. We become vulnerable for someone to ignore it or to criticize it. The artist, when the artist puts things out, it can be so scary. The first time you stood on a stage and sang, the first time you walked on a podium and recited a poem, your first piano recital, terror. All of those places where we make ourselves vulnerable where we do something new. We take the risk that maybe someone, they won't understand it. They won't know what we invested in it and it will be treated with contempt, it will be disregarded. To be vulnerable is a part of the artistic, creative life. There's another part of the creative life that it has to do with vulnerability and that is the vulnerability that the artist takes you, the watcher, the listener, the receiver, into some place you didn't expect. Now you might receive something very beautiful. You might see something that, that causes your breath to stop, that helps you remember a landscape, to stand in the mountains or some wonderful, wonderful vacation spot. A painting piece of music, a poem, a play, can draw up in us such deep responsive emotion. And that response can be both affirming and beautiful and loving, or that artist can be so deeply into a truth that is in fact painful, harmful, record some horrible violence that we become vulnerable to that gift they have given us and it will haunt us for the moment or for weeks or forever folks who give to us their creative gift can in fact give us joy or give us heartbreak we become vulnerable to whatever it is they want to say. Here we go. This is certainly not a great painting, not intended to be, just an invitation. Just an invitation to come and sit on my friend Sarah's porch. 
You know, if, if we all had to be extraordinarily gifted and trained before we could offer a gift, well, let me ask you this. If you can't cook a souffle, does that mean you can't scramble an egg and make breakfast for the people you love? If you can't write the great American novel, does that mean you shouldn't be able to write a heartfelt thank you? or simply record in a diary some things that happened to you this day. If you can't play a concerto, does that mean you can't play chopsticks with your grandkids and let them think you're brilliant? If you can't sing an aria, does that mean you shouldn't sing in the shower for your own pleasure? All these gifts are given to us, and sometimes they're given for us for the resource of our soul, for the renewal of our soul. And, and sometimes when we share those gifts, they become gifts that go and live in other people's hearts. But this painting is not so much a painting as it is an invitation. It's an invitation to join me on a summer hot day and to sit in the midst of God's creation and to sit in an old-fashioned glider. And we'll sit together and we'll find our bodies We'll find how to rock in harmony with just a little toe action, making the glider swing back and forth. We'll talk about some times when we've abandoned ourselves to the moment and the joy and the release and how we long for those moments when we abandon ourselves to the gifts God has given us. And then if we rock a little bit longer, we might be able to heal ourselves from the contempt that has been aimed at us, maybe on purpose or maybe just inadvertently. We'll find a little healing, and if we rock long enough, we might be able even to put down some of the contempt we have held in our hearts, because I will tell you, the contempt that comes to you is just as harmful as the contempt you hold and send out into the world. So just let that contempt go. And if we sit there and rock long enough, even in silence, maybe we will become vulnerable to the spirit, and to the breeze, and to the creative spirit that moved over the face of the earth. And one of us might remember that beautiful poem by Mary Oliver about a summer day. And we'll ask the question to each other that she asked to us. Tell me, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And we'll rock and will ponder. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.